Uh, let me first ask for a show of hands, how many of you are not members of NOVAC? That's great. That's great because the reason we're doing this is we want to share our passion for astronomy with the general public. So thank you all for coming out tonight. And I hope you plan to stay late. Please remember that uh, the public is allowed to stay until 11 p.m. And although it may seem slow motion at some times, there are always wondrous things up in the night sky. And we will do our bit to present them to you tonight. Uh, let me uh, mention two other things. We have two individuals who are very much to be congratulated for today's program. Uh, the first of those is our special speakers coordinator, Mike Lewis over here, who arranged for our guest. Please give him a round of applause. And out there greeting the van in the blue hat and the blue shirt is John DeRiso, and he's the overall organizer for our Astronomy Day program this year. Uh, he and a raft of volunteers have come together to put this on for you. If you happen to run into John, that's too bad, because if he's still standing there, that means you've crunched him going out tonight. Okay, a little humor there. If you happen to see John, please thank him for the program that the whole club has been able to put on. He's the guy that ramrodded it all. Uh, with no further ado, I'll ask Mike uh, to come up and introduce our speaker, and then we'll get to someone who's really interesting to listen to. Thank you, Rob. Well, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a labor of love. We're glad to have you all with us. Uh, this is Novak's 25th anniversary year. We're one of the largest astronomy clubs in the country. That means a lot, I think, to our organization. We're uh, about 900 strong in building, and in commemoration of that wonderful milestone, uh, we're bringing in some uh, notable figures in the amateur astronomy world this year, beginning with Rod Melise. Rod is the expert on a type of telescope that's perhaps, I think, one of the, one of the better designs, uh, enduring designs, the schmidt Cassegrain, and uh, certainly one of the older designs out there. He's going to talk all about it. He's the expert. He's written a book on uh, the schmidt Cassegrain telescope, and uh, you can get that off of the internet, as well as I'm sure many other sources. Um, he'll be talking about his interest there. He is also a writer, a prolific writer, among uh, amateur, amateur astronomy publications, the latest being Night Sky, which is geared toward the beginner. And a lot of you guys are new to the hobby, I believe, so uh, Rod will uh, be of interest to you. He's written the cover story for the latest edition of Night Sky, which is uh, the March-April edition, uh, Let's Party. So he's certainly a happening kind of guy and a, a fitting person to begin this evening's program. Without further ado, fellow Alabamian Rod Melise. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And yeah, who is ready to party? Yeah. Howdy, y'all. How you doing? Sure is good to be here. Sure is good. I get a funny feeling every time I ride on airplanes these days. Maybe it's just because uh, I'm a child of the 60s, but something about being surrounded by 10 uniformed people uh, in Mobile, Alabama just does not go with me. I know they're here to protect us and all that. Yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, at any rate, I suppose I'm lucky that nobody has come up with a do not fly list for rednecks. Then I would be in trouble. <laughs> By the way, while I've got y'all's attention, what is this? They give me this on the airplane for breakfast, and it says it was wholesome and chewy. It sure was chewy. Uh, any of you who can identify what this was made out of, please see me after the program. I did eat one of these. I was afraid to eat the second one without knowing. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. Let's get started. Uh, we're here to talk telescopes. I'm going to be talking a certain kind of telescope, and I know there are some novices out there who will say, what in the heck is he going on about? And, uh, well, that's your problem. But uh, rest assured, if I get through my many, many slides, I will take plenty of questions, and you can ask anything you like. Only, not too personal, please. It might get back to my wife. You know how she is. Anyway, the subject tonight is the past, present, and future of the schmidt cassegrain telescope. For the uninitiated, a schmidt cassegrain is one of these things uh, that you'll see out on the field. What does it look like? It doesn't look much like what you think a telescope ought to look like. That is a long tube. It looks like a beer keg on a tripod. And maybe that's what attracted to me to it in the beginning, but that's another story. 
basically it's a telescope that uses lenses and mirrors to make an image. Anywho. Oops, there you go. Do you like cats? Yeah. Three-footed or four, four? Yeah, let's hear it for the kitty cats. But uh, we're talking tonight not about our four-footed friends, uh, you know, with apologies to this stout fellow, but two three-footed cats. What is he talking about? Uh, that same telescope I was telling you about that is one that uses mirrors and lenses to produce images is known as a cat, short for catadioptric. That sounds like a stupid old $5 word, but the meaning is simple. It just means a telescope that uses lenses and mirrors. And uh, there was a time when these telescopes were new to astronomy, but now they have a real history, much of it being pretty girls being used to uh, advertise telescopes in lieu of dorky looking fellows. <laughs> uh, and yes, I do not go through a presentation without uh, talking about pretty girls unless my wife gets on to me and then I will stop. She's not here. But I'll try not to be too politically incorrect. Where do these telescopes come from? Well, they're called Schmidt Cassegrains and they came from two folks way back when in the earlier 20th century, Schmidt and Cassegrain. But more than anything else, they came from a man named Tom Johnson out in California whose goal was to build a nice portable telescope. <laughs> that doesn't look portable to you. Well, it, it, it was portable uh, for the day. If you could have seen what an 18.5 inch telescope normally looked like back then, yes, that was portable. At any rate, this was a man who was the president of a small electronics company, Valor Electronics, who wanted to build telescopes for himself and his children and got carried away. He went on to uh, start a company called Celestron that many of you are familiar with. And lots more words on them and the current state of them a little later. This is what we all wanted way back when, 65, 66, all us geeky kids who were into this astronomy stuff wanted a Celestron C10, like this, uh, the king of the nerds here is looking through. Uh, of course, we could not uh, even begin to afford one. Uh, that didn't mean we didn't want it, though. This is the Down with Love telescope. Who saw this? I, I'm not talking about Mrs. Elwiger. Who saw this movie? Uh, Whoever researched it, it was an homage, homage, if I may say, to uh, the Doris Day Rock Hudson films, wanted a telescope in the movie. They actually had a classic Celestron from 1964 or 65. Uh, it was easy to look at. It was beautiful. I mean the telescope. <laughs> but these were telescopes for small colleges, for wealthy people. They were not for the average amateur astronomer until 1970 when they came out with this wonderful telescope that's called the Orange Tube. Can anybody tell me why it was called the Orange Tube? It has an orange tube. At any rate, this was something you could dream of. It cost $1,000, give or take, in great big old 1970 dollars. I was a missile launch officer at the time, living off Uncle Sam, and I could finally afford a new telescope. Can I tell you all a story about choosing telescopes and what you think you want and what you really might want? When I was a young sprout, and I think Phil Harrington probably felt the same way, the one telescope I wanted was a telescope called a cave. It was a Newtonian reflector. You've seen some like it out on the field with a big long tube. Legendary optics, and I thought it was the cat's meow, even if it wasn't a cat. I bought me one. Then I discovered something really quickly. It's no fun taking a telescope with a five or six foot tube up into the Ozark Mountains in the middle of winter time. <laughs> this telescope I thought I wanted so much and was going to be so wonderful wasn't what I wanted or needed after all. This turned out to be what I wanted and what I needed. It had large aperture, for those days anyway, my gosh, eight inches, and it was portable. It was about two feet long. It fit in the back of my MGB, folks. I didn't have to stick the tube out the window. 
That was the beginning of my love affair with three-legged cats that has endured until this very day. Celestron was cool. People wanted to copy it, copy them, compete with them. If you ever see a telescope like this, do not buy it. It was junk. This company, Criterion, made some wonderful reflecting telescopes, but they did not quite get the formula for the SCT, if I may call the schmidt cassegrain that, down. They came and they eventually went. By the way, you'll notice I'm not using notes. That's because I left the notes in the car with my wife. But I don't like them anyway. I make it up as I go along. Uh, I've yet to figure out what exactly Miss was doing with a C8 at the beach. <laughs> I don't know. But the point of this little slide is that Celestron enjoyed many years of dominance in amateur telescopes. Until Mead came along. Who's heard of Mead? Raise your hand, come on. Even I see novices clearly out there who have heard of Mead. They are a great success story. They, uh if I may, copy the Celestron idea, but they did it much better than Criterion, uh, and they have been a big force in amateur telescopes ever since. If you're interested in technical stuff, see me after, and I'll go into the minutiae. But uh, here we have Celestron trying to catch up, and that has been the story with these telescopes. schmidt cassegrains are telescopes unlike most other kinds that are only produced by two companies. Mead and Celestron. They're two small companies, they have the same customer base, and they sell a nearly identical product. So what it usually boils down to is who has the coolest looking ad. Do you like this better? Can I see of hands? Show of hands? Or do you like this one better? All the guys have raised their hands for this one. That's okay. That's okay. And the 1980s went on, and not everybody wanted an 8-inch telescope. An 8-inch telescope's big. Even an SCT is big. Your wife might not want that, or your husband might not want that in the living room where I keep my scopes. So you could get something a little smaller, like this kitten, or that kitten. Or if you're obsessive-compulsive like your old Uncle Rod, you got something like that. Then a bad thing happened. Who was around in this crazy game for Comet Halley? Quite a few of you. The thing was, it was love. we thought it was an amateur astronomer's dream come true. Everybody was into astronomy. Everybody wanted a telescope. Then two unfortunate things happened. Uh, for one, the comet was, i got to admit, sort of a flop. Yeah. It certainly wasn't what people had been led to believe it would be from long exposure photographs from the turn of the century. That was one thing. The other thing was the telescope companies went crazy. Mead and Celestron built telescopes until they wore out their workforces and wore out their tools and started producing optics that were, shall we say, something less than good. Also, they wore out the patience of the public who just wanted to look at the comet and was being sold these things that didn't do that very well at all. And there followed a depression in amateur telescopes and in SCTs. And sometimes I think this is why, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, you amateurs out there, you experienced amateurs, know what I'm talking about when I say the SCT has had a bad reputation for a long time. Am I right? Yeah. Undeserved in my opinion, but that bad reputation comes from Halley scopes, scopes built in huge numbers, thrown out the door uh, without much regard to quality, and both companies were guilty of it. Uh, it also saw the end of the Criterion telescopes for all time. They'd been sold out to Bosch and Long. As is often the case of amateurs in amateur astronomy, though there was irony here. This Bosch and Lom 8-inch telescope, if you ever see one, buy it, it's great. But uh, they decided they didn't want to have anything to do with crazy amateur astronomers, and there was much better uh, profit and sanity involved in selling binoculars, rifle scopes, and 60-millimeter telescopes to department stores, and they were right. And there's also one more player. This is what I'm after. Has anybody seen one of these? You need to give it to me. I'm after it. 
This is a Takahashi SCT. I bet you refractor snobs did not know that Takahashi, your beloved company, made lowly Schmidt Cassegrains. Yes, sir, they did. The TSC 225, a 9-inch Schmidt Cassegrain that we thought was the cat's meow, literally. Problem was, I think this was about 1988, 89 time frame, maybe 90. My, my brain is going, luckily that's the only thing. Uh, it cost $4,000 with no mount, just the telescope, and it failed miserably. The reason being, I think, was that people who had the money to uh, buy a Takahashi scope for $4,000 did not want to dirty themselves with a Schmidt Cassegrain, the saps. Uh, but what happened? What really, 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 really happened in the 80s that had a huge impact on amateur astronomy that continues to be felt today was that somebody built a telescope with go to. A telescope with a computer that automatically points at anything. Want to see a galaxy? Push a few buttons. Want to see a planet? Push a few buttons. Somebody built one. Who was that somebody? Me? Did somebody say me? Eh, we have some nice partying gifts for you. Oh, come on. Ah, ah, there it is. Celestron built the first commercial go-to scope, the CompuStar. There was a problem with this. They wanted $22,000 for a 14-inch scope. And that was the main thing wrong with these. They were not perfect, but the stories that you experienced amateurs have heard about them were somewhat inaccurate. They did work fairly well. I used a C14 CompuStar at the Texas Star Party recently, and it worked quite well within certain parameters. Uh, they just cost too much. They just cost too much. What else went on after Halley? Meade decided they were going to try an SCT of a new type, sort of like a party of a new type. We've heard that before. Uh, the LX6, most Schmidt cast grains have a focal ratio of F10. What that gobbledygook means is they produce normally high magnifications. Real great for looking at the moon and planets, not so hot for looking at big star clusters. Meade came along with a telescope that was uh, F6.3. Showed you wider views of the heavens. And we thought that was pretty cool at first, but then reality set in. It being that it was hard for me to mass produce these optics uh, and continue to provide the quality that they had with their older telescopes, the F10 telescopes. Uh, also what it was found out was that the addition of a small lens for about $100 to an F10 SCT did the same thing that the expensive LX6 did and me kept trying to do F6.3 for quite a few years and eventually gave up. Ah, uh, Celestron, I don't know where they got this dude. Does that look like a... That looks sort of like Dobie Gillis' evil twin? I don't know. But this is one thing that shows how much amateur astronomy has changed. What excited the heck out of us back in the 80s? Hey, guess what? They're coming out with a telescope that works on a battery. You don't have to lug a car battery around anymore. Uh, that was technological advance to us back then. No computers. You didn't have to lug around your car's battery. Celestron continued doing what Celestron did, making nice telescopes. A lot of you have heard of the Ultima series. A lot of people called them photographer's telescopes. They were very good, but not very exciting. But Meade, if nothing else, had an idea what was exciting. And this is really the telescope that changed everyone. Everybody say its name. LX200, LX200, LX200. Not the perfect scope, but a breakthrough nevertheless. A telescope that would actually do what the CompuStar promised and did. Push a button and you see stuff. Push a lot of buttons and you see a lot of stuff. But what they did was do it for not too much money. Believe you me, 1995 in 92 was still a lot of money for a lot of people, but it wasn't $22,000. It was not, again, the perfect telescope, but it was different, and it was exciting. 
this telescope has probably excited more people than any other telescope that has ever been produced for the amateur. And some people will disagree. Let's fight. I'm sticking to my guns. Uh, and even then, though, it was you go back and look at these old ads, it would automatically go to 700 objects, many of which were stars. Now your average department store telescope will go to 30,000, even if you can't see any of them. Uh, and Mead kept rolling right along. A lot of people like this little thing. This was the 2045 4-inch SCT. You thought I was going to say ETX, didn't you? The joke's on you. Their small SCT. Who's that? I don't know. That's more like it in my opinion, but I'm politically incorrect. I admit it. Sorry. I ain't going to change, probably. That's what my wife says and then just shakes her head. Uh, Celestron didn't know what to do. It had become the perception in the public mind that they did not do electronics nor computers very well at all or know anything about them, even though the reality was that they had at least had some hand in the development of the first computerized scope. They thought it would be a good time to bring out a cheap C8, and that was what most people thought about it. It was cheap. Now this telescope excited a lot of folks and still does today. This is the C9.25 tube assembly. And you could, could then and now get it on a variety of mounts, but some people consider this to be the best schmidt cast grain optics set ever produced then or since. And if you want to know why, bring me $10 after the program and I'll tell you. But this was the main thing that Celestron did in the 90s, the early to mid 90s. Unfortunately, that was not very exciting for most people. Heck, Mead's got a 10! Who cared if the optics were wonderful? So Celestron said, why don't we make a telescope that goes to stuff? And they came out with this thing. Uh, the physics department where I teach has one, and it's not a bad scope. It's a sweet little scope. You can't take pictures very well with it, and it doesn't like going to planets, but otherwise it's a pleasant scope. It's nice and light, and it has some... Uh, interesting features. It didn't exactly take the world by storm. Uh, but Mead wasn't perfect either. They came out with the LX50 and it was the first non-go-to scope to show that uh, you can mess up the computers on a non-computerized scope. Don't ask. This is a scope that a lot of folks love. This is the little baby. I see them at star parties everywhere I go. And their owners love them very, very much. They're small. Even with the 5 inch, you're somewhat limited uh, in what you can see in deep space. But they're inexpensive. The optics are almost universally excellent. And they have lots of go-to computer whiz-bang, hooked to a PC, look at numbers flashing stuff. How many ETX owners out there? We got any? One, two, three, four. Gracious. Oh, I, you know, there's nothing bad to say about it other than the fact that it's small and please save your questions to the end. We're rolling right along. Poor old Celestron. This was the first time they got themselves, well, sort of the second time, but I won't go into that. The first time they got themselves into real trouble, they ran out of money and got bought out by Tasco. Who knows what Tasco was? It was considered the evil side of astronomy, the company that made the, the um, 60 millimeter department store refractors that they designed for you to point at the sun and burn your eyes out with. So you can imagine, we thought it was all a joke when somebody came on the internet and said, hey, Celestron owners, your scope's really a Tasco. Alas, it was true, or maybe not. The alas, I mean. Celestron has had a problem for the last, oh, 15, 20 years, 20 years maybe, a lack of capital. And that problem became worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Tasco allowed them to develop their own go-to scopes, the next stars. They worked quite well, and people really liked, starting with a 5-inch. Uh, it was sort of like the ETX, 
but it used Schmidt Cassegrain accessories. It was reasonably priced, it was rugged, and it had very good optics itself. But guess what? Tasco must have bought too many rifle scopes or something. They went bankrupt and Celestron was getting ready to go under. Again. It turned out to be a good thing at the time anyway because Celestron was then bought out by three of the people in its management who had long experience with the company. Alan Hale, Joseph Lupica, and Rick Hedrick. They did a lot of good things. They came out with this puppy. This is my current favorite personal scope, the Next Star 11. C11, nice and big, uh, almost frightening, bit, frighteningly big when you look at one for the first time, but guess what? Celestron did something Meade had never thought of. They actually put handles on the scope that you could use, which meant you can lift this 60 pound scope onto its tripod even if you're as weak, decrepit, and broke down an old hillbilly as I am. Lots of people hear about GPS vis-a-vis -vis telescopes. That's the buzzword. Is it good or bad? It's, uh, it's great for lazy people. Uh, if you, like I do, are lazy by nature, it's great. And if you, like me, travel to a lot of star parties in wonderful places like this, it's double great. Because I don't have to look up the latitude and the longitude. I don't have to look up the time on my stupid watch, which I can't read anyway. I don't have to remember what date it is. I don't remember have to figure out which star is where. I turn it on and I say, okay. And it points at two stars and I center them and I'm good to go for the rest of the night. Frankly, though, if you're not as lazy as I am, you just observe from home. You don't need GPS. A regular go-to scope is fine if you do not mind going through the dreary drudgery of figuring out the time and punching that in the buttons of course now some people are like I am and can't program a VCR so GPS is probably a good thing for us and you don't have to identify yourselves uh, ergonomic handles slip rings anybody ever worked in radar I thought it was a great idea. No more cord wrap on the telescope. Unfortunately, they forgot one thing. If you live where the dew is heavy, you have to attach a heater to the corrector plate and slip ring fancy stuff or not, the cords all wrap around your telescope and pull out the power cord and you start crying and stuff. So that's the way it goes. Uh, is anybody interested in gems? Some are, yeah. Well, I don't know. Don't ask me because I don't know. These are two more of Celestron's scopes. And as you can see that Celestron, one of the things they tried to do to differentiate themselves, that's isn't that what the marketing experts say, we got to differentiate ourselves, is maybe aiming their stuff at a... Uh,